I watched them and I observed and thought, I, I, I may not be a visionary director, but I could be as good as that guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to The Other 50%, a herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. This episode is brought to you by the entertainment payroll company, Extreme Reach. They are committed to becoming the most inclusive and diverse payroll company in the business. They have the most comprehensive suite of tools and services to support all areas of media and content creation, from tax incentive support to accounting software and payroll services. If you are making film and television, call them. Tell them I sent you. For this episode, I have to admit I was fangirling a bit because I got to interview Nell Scovell. Nell wrote just the funny parts and a few hard truths about sneaking into the Hollywood Boys Club. It is hilarious and a must read. I read it twice and ate it whole. In addition to that gem of a book, Nell Scovell is a television and magazine writer, producer, director, and collaborator on the number one New York Times bestseller, Lean In, Our Bible, Women Work and the Will to Lead. She was the creator of the television series Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and her TV writing credits include The Simpsons, Coach, Monk, Murphy Brown, Charmed, and NCIS. She's directed two movies for cable television and an episode of Awkward. She has contributed to Vanity Fair, Vogue, Rolling Stone, and the New York Times. This was very exciting for me, and hopefully for you too. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, the merchandise. You can listen on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast places. And if you haven't already, check out our other two podcasts, The Kiss My Age Show, which is where women of a certain vintage, you know, grown-ups, talk about anything and everything and all the things that matter. And if you fall into that category, please join the Facebook group and join in the conversation. And Exit 38 is a show where two people who seem to be opposites from a political perspective discuss the issues of the day while trying to find common ground. All right, here's my conversation with Nels Goval. Have a listen. Normally I start with what do you do, but I think we all know what you do. And I just kind of want to start in the middle, if that's okay. Like, can we start with Lean In? Oh, sure. <laughs> that It is not hyperbole to say that book changed my life. I'm Seriously. so happy to hear that. You know, someone once stopped me and said, what did we say before Lean In? We, I think we just wondered, like, what is happening and what is wrong with me, I, I think I, is what we said. And then that put words to all of it. Yeah. No, I think it gave permission. What Cheryl did was gave permission to women to be ambitious. Yeah. And she gave it a nice phrasing so it doesn't sound uh, too pushy. You know, the joke is that if I'd written the book alone, it would have been called Barge In. <laughs> And, and uh, storm no, the castle. Yeah, but but Cheryl is um, much smarter and understands that you know we we can make room at the table without you know burning it all down. Yeah, see that would be my instinct too. Like yeah. burn it down, let the chips <laughs> fall yeah. where they may. But By the way, that is the it. end game. Oh, right? for sure, but, for sure. But baby steps, baby steps. Well, you got to get women in leadership positions first, right. and then change will happen more quickly. That is going to be the ticket, just get more women in the room. Yeah. But it was, I think it started, at least for me, that was a, a new shift in the national conversation. Because we were all like, free to be you and me. And then, oh my God, none of that was true. And now what do we do? And then I think it kind of shifted and, to me, launched kind of where we are now. Because now we all had a whole new vocabulary and unconscious bias. And what does all this mean? And blah, 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 blah. And then yeah. here we are today. Yeah. So thank you for that. That was super Oh, well, Exciting. thanks, Cheryl. And the other thing, I, th I really think one of the um, long-lasting effects of Lean In is, uh, you know, Madeleine Albright has that famous, there's a special place in hell for women who don't help mm -hmm. other women. And it was sort of this, this duty you bore. I think Cheryl showed that it's, it's fun to help other women. And she yeah. lives that in her life. And that um, it's not a duty, but it's, it's a smart strategy. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it, and it is so effective. And I think the myth of the catty catty bitches who are trying to stab you in the back along the way, I think we just have to get to a place of not tolerating that because women help each other. Right. And, and I think you have to outnumber them. Yes, it's, exactly. It's what you do. And then suddenly they'll see, look, it's a strategy to stab other women in the back. It comes from that old, there can be only one right. idea and the queen bee. And there's a reason it was true. 
as it becomes less true, you want those people to switch their strategy to the, oh, a rising tide lifts all boats. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, so <laughs> if they're smart, they'll come to our side. That's right. Okay, so you grew up in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and then you started as a sports writer. Yeah. Tell me about that, and then how did you transition into television? Well, if you grew up in Boston in the late 60s and 70s, it was pretty hard not to be a sports fan. The Red Sox, the Celtics, the Bruins, you know, we're all going, it, well, mostly going the distance, not my beloved Red Sox. They have <laughs> since made it. Although people were calling me and like, are you happy? And it's like, no, I wanted Carl Yastrzemski you know, to win the World Series. I don't even know these new people. <laughs> so I did love sports and I watched a lot of sports with my father. I did not play. I had a brother who was a really good athlete who was a tennis player. Uh, and so when I get to college and I, I want to go into journalism, you know, there was always something in me though that wasn't as serious as the other <laughs> kids who wanted to be journalists. Yeah. And sports writing became a way to write and be part of the newspaper while being able to make some jokes. Mm -hmm. And then did that also kind of help you relate to men in the workplace better, do you think, having that background? Well, it did get me used to be, being one of the few women in a more typically male environment. And I think it, it made me, it gave me something to talk about too. So, you know, I worked on the show Coach for two and a half years. And I think being able to, in that first meeting with the great Barry Kemp, who created that show and created New Heart, it gave me cred. Because I did actually go on and I was a professional sports writer for the Boston Globe for a while. And, and that was a great experience. Yeah. And then you went to Spy Magazine in New York? Yeah. Yeah. That sounded like it was really fun. Well, I, I wish everyone has the opportunity in their 20s to work at a place that shares their sensibility. So, you know, I, I had a snarky streak to me <laughs> and mostly I tamped it down and I get to spy and they're like, let it fly. You're like, yes! <laughs> let it rip, be as snarky as you want to be. And that really allowed me to, I think, find my voice. Yeah, I know yeah. you did that that article. Uh, I don't know the title, too rich but and too, thin. too rich and too thin. Yeah. That's where I'm going, and that that kind of blew up, didn't it? It did. I mean, we didn't have the world viral back in the day, but it it got picked up by a lot of outlets by Page Six, and um, it was that was that was exciting actually. Now, were you surprised by the women being willing to talk about how much how much they weighed and how much money they had? Oh, no, because they both, they were all very thin and very rich. So, you know, I think when I gave them an opportunity to brag about it, I think it was Nan Kempner, who was 5'7", who, when I asked her what she weighed, said 110, but I was wearing a fur coat. <laughs> <laughs> so she weighed 72 pounds. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, they were, they, they were uh, in it, which was the calculation of, of why you could report that piece was because that was something that they had worked hard to achieve. Yeah, it was big accomplishments. Yeah. Early in the book, you talked about you wanted to be a writer because you wanted to be near the action, but not necessarily in the spotlight. Yeah. And then that also gave you a lot of power, like when you wrote the speeches for um, Obama and the White House correspondents. Well, I didn't write speeches. I wrote jokes. Jokes, OK. <laughs> I wish I'd written speeches. And um, yeah, no, you know, the the impact you have to you know it's one of the things I'm discovering now is the concept of writing for real people mm -hmm. versus fictional characters and I always joke with Sheryl Sandberg that she's my um, favorite character to write for <laughs> next to Murphy Brown uh, but you know it is look these people all have very strong perspectives points of view you as a writer I get to enhance those points of view. I'm mm -hmm. not putting words in anyone's mouth, but it it does have more impact, I think, when you, it's a joke you wrote that Hillary Clinton's making. How thrilling is that? That was pretty good. She was so magnificent that night at the Al Smith dinner. Yeah. She was really funny. Um, and then I just, uh, you know, I write in the book about that awful moment when Trump just gets up and says she hates Catholics. It, it was so ugly. It yeah. was so ugly. 
He was not having people help write him joke, it seems. No, he had a, he had a good zinger about Melania, remember, when it's like when, she, when Michelle Obama says something, everybody loves it, and when Melania says the same thing, <laughs> they're, they're all angry. So, but yeah, no, it's always someone who's else who's the butt of his jokes. Right. But I disagree with people who say he has no sense of humor. And in fact, when I, I got to be on Colbert, which was an Exciting. amazing experience, you know, because as a writer, you're always in the back of the theater or you're in the wings or you're watching, you know, upstairs on a, on a tiny feed. Yeah. And I got to sit on stage next to him when he read these jokes that I had written for. I didn't write them for Trump, but if I were writing for Trump, these were the jokes I would have made. And I got to feel the full force of the audience laughter. And oh, it, how fun. It was. And I have to go watch that. Oh, it, 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 he was so nice, too. But, you know, all day I was stressing about my appearance and thinking, like, I don't know how these talk show hosts do this every night. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot of stress to think millions of people will be watching me and there's the physical part and then there's the nervousness about can I perform. And then <laughs> when I sat on stage and felt that the just that wave rush. of laughter flow over me, I was like, oh, okay, now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so ironically, this year in this book has really put you in the spotlight. A uh, little bit. I mean, I feel like I'm sort of like sticking my head in and saying, hello. <laughs> uh, and then I pull back. It's not like people are stopping me in airports. Not yet. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so has that been fun? Let's oh, do it a little bit. Um, yeah, you know, there's a little bit of the Kilroy, Kilroy was here, where you feel like if I didn't tell my story, no one would. Mm -hmm. You know, who better to write my memoir than me? Yes. Um, so I'm, I, I am glad to have, you know, planted that flag. And um, I feel grateful that I'm at this moment in history where we're caring about women's narratives. You know, I, I'm not sure 10 years ago I could have sold this book. Right, so. and to be so in the thick of this conversation yeah. is so important and so exciting. In the book, I actually tell this Me Too story mm -hmm. of how I'm, it's a little hard to know what the right terminology is. I'll say sexually manipulated by this head writer early in my career. And when I wrote this, it was one of the chapters that sold the book uh, three years ago. And I was very nervous about telling that story. Of course. So meanwhile, in October, you know, the Weinstein story comes out and the movement, Alyssa Milano and Tarana Burke, you know, mm -hmm. just explodes. And then I it kind of flipped and then I was like, I can't wait for my book to come <laughs> out because I did want to be part of that, you know, that very large group of yes. very brave women. I saw a shift just doing this because I started two years ago and it used to be I would turn the recorder off and then people would start telling me their sexual harassment stories. Oh. And I'd say, can I turn it back on? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. We're like, no, we're not going to talk yeah. about it. And now people will volunteer because I think we've shifted the shame to the perpetrators, yes. which has freed us all up. Um, that's part of it. My my less optimistic take is we have nothing left to lose. <laughs> There's that too. Yeah. That I, I think we felt like, well, you know, we'll be good girls and we'll go along and we'll just be professional and so good at our work that it will be recognized. Right. And the numbers haven't changed. I mean, the numbers of writers and TV have gotten a little better. It's still not 50 50 not, and not even close. Mm -hmm. But the numbers for directors is still low. The numbers of, you know, how many studios are head, headed year by women. Year after year, it doesn't move change. an inch. And so I think there, yeah. there was a, when Trump became president, it's like, oh, okay, no one's going to save us. It's We might as well speak some truth. Yeah. Now, I know there was a little bit of forward motion in the 90s, and then it kind of stopped. Yeah. And you wrote, uh, Bill Clinton's dick put a stop to the whole thing. And I was like, oh. <laughs> I, like, I had, I, no one had connected those dots for me before. Like, do you I, think really that's what? Well, in that? two ways. I don't want to put it. So, two ways. The first way was he got away with it, right? Yeah, he did. Abuse of power um, gets away with it. But also, it's like, this young woman almost brought him down. And I think people became nervous about having women in the room. Women became the, were the mm. enemy in that story. Right. 
And risky. Risky, yes. And then the second thing is I think his his dick, which I, and I truly, and I said it at the time, believed he should have resigned mm -hmm. over that, let Al Gore become president, but his ego wouldn't let him. And I think that led us to George Bush and, and all the horrors that happened to women um, under his regime. And then here we are now. And here we are now. Yeah, it's at, a, it's at the cultural tone of, of we're still not going there. Yeah. And there, I think it was something about him that was still so you know, charismatic, and we, we wanted him politically, you know, I think. I, yeah. You know, no, I it, look at that, how I looked at it at the time is completely different about how I look at it now. Really? Because yeah. I, can I tell you, one, of the, one, one fun thing is I was always a supporter of Monica Lewinsky. Mm -hmm. I thought she was always cast in the wrong light, and I, I sympathized with her, and maybe I even related to her. Oh, and, I totally did. Yeah. I thought if I was 22 working for Bill Clinton, yeah. I, I might have done the same thing. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't go there. I just felt like, wow, they are demonizing this yeah. very young woman. And he's the one who, you know, who had all the power. Um, since then, I've become friends with her. I've gotten Aww. to know her a little. And she's delightful. She's lovely. Like, he is so lucky she's a good person. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Where's, she never wrote the book. She, yeah. you know, she's spoken out, but it's always very um, thoughtfully. And I, I'm just so impressed with her. So I'm glad, like, my initial reaction to her uh, proved to be correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and her TED Talk on bullying, like, she was the first, really, person who was internet bullied so horribly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, very moving. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's talk about your first couple of TV jobs. I know that um, you were often the only woman in the room. And it's funny, you, you quoted someone, and, and I say this all the time too, like initially you're kind of proud to be the only woman in the room, and then you realize it's a problem, like it's a yeah. symptom. Yeah. No, Alexandra Petrie had that great quote about how, um, uh, you know, I used to think it made me special and now I realize it would... <laughs> it's a it, problem. Yeah, it showed there was a big problem. I mean, I wouldn't say I, I crowed too much and I also tell the story in the book about uh, one of my first jobs was on this late night talk show called the Wilton North Report, mm -hmm. which was so bad that when I called Fox to get permission to use a photo, from one of the shows, um, the person in business affairs uh, insisted there was never a show <laughs> named the Wilton North Report on the Fox network, and I must be mistaken. They will never speak of it. So they, they <laughs> wiped it from their corporate memory. That's but um, I was there, I know it existed, and when it got canceled, we were sitting around in a group and talking about if we'd ever work again. Um, and one of the guys said to me, uh, well, Mel, you're lucky. And I said, why am I lucky? And he said, because every show is looking for a woman. And I said, a woman and 10 men. Yeah, how does that make me lucky? So that was actually, that, you know, that was really early. That was the late 80s. So I already sort of understood that the ratio in the bigger sense was not in my favor. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that group sitting around wondering if we'd ever work again included Greg Daniels, who created The Office and Parks and Rec, and um, Conan O'Brien. <laughs> A real loser group. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. It did I, not destroy us. That, and people are having the same conversation today. Oh, you're so lucky to be a woman in this business. And a everyone's director. Looking everyone's one. looking. And it's like they, the numbers do not bear it out. And, you know, I'm so sick of, you know, Joe Russo and people like that saying, it's getting better for women. And I don't see the statistical data that backs right. that up. And, it's, and if I do, it's not sustained, right? You can't just say it's getting better right. and, and that makes it instantly better. Like Ava DuVernay has all women directing her She's show. She's amazing. Yes. And it's one show and people think, oh, we're done or men are getting mad about it. Are they? they? Yeah. Good. <laughs> so she tweeted, because someone like, threatened to sue her, and she's like, please do, and then I can sue all the studios for shutting out women for 100 years. Yeah. Like, let's do that. Um, uh, can we talk a little bit about your time on Letterman? Sure. 
<laughs> I mean, it was a million years ago, but yes. But still, it feels significant, especially since recently. Did you see his interview with Tina Fey? I wrote an article about it. <laughs> oh, I guess for you New did. York Magazine. Because he still seemed just bewildered that women would want to write on his show. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's they they try to rewrite reality. Yeah. And you know, it's this whole gaslighting at scale mm -hmm. that, that we're all living through. And um, yeah, so I wrote this big article for um, The Cut, which just called him out. And the craziest part was he makes this point of complimenting Tina Fey for being the first female head writer of Saturday Night Live. You know who the first female writer for late night TV was? Meryl Marco, who was head writer at The Letterman Show and Dave's girlfriend And at he doesn't the time. even see that? And he seems to have wiped her from his memory. <laughs> um, oh. So I write about that in the article. And um, she had the best line, just the best, best line, because I, I wrote to her and said, you know, did, do you have any reaction? And she wrote back, um, maybe because we were having sex, he thought I was an intern. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Meryl was head writer. She won. Um, they won, I think, five Emmys with her as head writer. And do you know that writing staff never won another Emmy after that, hmm. after she left? Curious. No, not curious. She's a genius. And that was a solid burn. Oh, she's the best. <laughs> she's the greatest. So it's funny how, how you were kind of in a catch-22 there, how Dave didn't really talk to the writers, but he would stop by your office to say hello, which then you thought made it look suspicious and you didn't want that. So then you shut your door so you stopped having access to yeah. him. It's like you can't win either no. way. No. I, I really And I really did feel like I someone mentioned, one of the other writers mentioned to me that Dave seemed to be spending a lot of time in my office. And I really thought I've worked too hard to earn this position. You know, most, most of the men who worked for late night, you know, came straight from Spy. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I had to go work on Wilton North Report, an entire season of Newhart. I wrote a Simpsons, you know, and then they would have me. And it was my dream job, so I, I took it and then five months later said, this is not a good place for me. It's not so dreamy. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about... It wasn't a nightmare. <laughs> well, it kind of was, now that I think about it. I didn't understand because it was pre-Anita Hill mm -hmm. and I didn't even have the vocabulary to say, oh, there's sexual favoritism, there's sexual harassment, and not just Dave, you know, the, the fish stinks from the head down. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was rampant um, among the staff. You know, I just thought it was fucked up. <laughs> right. Like that word you had. <laughs> I had those words. And then Anita Hill came along, and that was a very transformative moment for me. Like, she really made me understand. There's something about having the language for things really helps us to... Well, that's like lean in. Yeah, yeah. totally, totally. Because yeah. I think our first, um, our first instinct is to think, okay, what can I be doing better in the situation? Or what training do I need? Or how do I need to phrase it better? Right. And sometimes it is just systemic. Exactly. And to realize that is so empowering and to figure it out. Yeah, and Cheryl does that better than anyone. She really oh, does. Yeah. Her TED Talk, why we have so few women leaders, every Fantastic. it should be required viewing. It she, is for all my friends. I yeah. Oh, <laughs> good. It around to everybody. <laughs> the job you were on where it was going to be a table read of your script and you didn't sit at the table. You sat along the periphery. Yeah. That was on Newhart, my first script, yeah. Yeah, like just that is, and then read it, uh, to hear that in the context of Lean In is like it, some things are so simple, you know, like yeah. sit at the table and own it, but we don't do that instinctively. Well, what, what I loved about, and Cheryl's TED Talk talks about sitting at the table, which it, I love because it's both figurative and literal, right. and it really connected with me because, you know, back in the day, my decision to sit on the periphery with the assistants instead of with the higher level writers at the table, and no one waved me over. Um, I thought that was a personal choice, mm -hmm. that I was being humble and um, you know, making a good decision. Yeah. What, what I now know was our culture forced me into that position where I didn't want to risk seeming arrogant and, you know, because... Because yeah. uh, we're not supposed to take right. up space like that. That's right.
It's so, it's fascinating to me. It really is. Yeah. Um, I just wish, like, all this time I, I need, I spend thinking about this stuff and, and strategizing about how to be perceived, like the hours I spend crafting emails so I don't sound too aggressive and too demanding. I, I just want that, I wish I had that time to write jokes because I exactly. really love writing jokes. It's such and, an extra burden. And dudes just get to write jokes. I mean, that is the goal. That is the end goal, right? <laughs> for me. Can we just do the not work. for everyone. <laughs> and not to freak out about the work. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the work. What would you say makes a great showrunner? So three things make a great leader. First, you have to be able to understand and communicate the mission incredibly well, better than anyone in the room. Two, I think you have to be the hardest working person in the room because you can't ask anyone to work harder than you. And third, I think you have to be the most generous person in the room. And not just generous like with money, but I, I'm talking about with, with with praise and with credit. And fourth, and this is where people really, um, I think, fall short, is you need to not just accept dissent, but welcome it and ask for it. What am I missing? What could be better? And really make people feel comfortable that they can um, you know, be honest in the room. That's huge and, yeah. and a gift, because I think so many people spend a lot of mental energy trying to figure out what their boss wants to hear. Right. Like in every yeah. arena. Yeah. So to create that space where people can actually challenge you. Yeah. It's, and, and it's the way to get the best product. Mm -hmm. There's no question. So um, yeah, th those are, you know, and I've, I've had a couple, uh, Barry Kemp, uh, Corby Siamis, uh, you know, really extraordinary people who are just so at the top of the game, but also willing to let others contribute and say, oh, that's a better idea than the one I just had. Yeah. Now, you also direct, and you said that your inspiration for directing was not genius, it was mediocrity. <laughs> It was. <laughs> so, like, that. I've worked on hundreds of TV shows, and I've seen brilliant directors, and I've seen people who were just, you know, uh, walking through their paces. Mm -hmm. And they might have been brilliant at one point. Maybe they got bored. Maybe they realized that the extra effort doesn't yield enough uh, benefit. But I, I watched them, and I observed, and thought. I, I, I may not be a visionary director, but I could be as good as that guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if that's the minimum of what we're going for, I could do that. Yeah, and I think uh, I, I solidly achieved mediocrity. <laughs> well done. Yeah. Uh, and talk a little bit about how uh, ridiculously hard it is to get jobs as a female director. Oh, it's, it's nearly impossible. I mean, statistically speaking. Mm -hmm. And um, I did, I've done two cable movies, one for Showtime and one for Lifetime that were eight years apart. You know, everyone said the hard one's the first one to get, and then I got it, and it was great. It was through Viacom, which had seen my work on Sabrina, and had seen me on set, so they knew I was capable of directing. And then I went in to meet with my agents after that to talk about, like, what's the next one? And they said, well, you know, the second movie's the hard one to get. <laughs> I was like, no, you said it was the first, and I got that, and I stayed under budget and came in on time. I did and, my job. And it got like, nominated for kids awards and stuff. And so, no, you can't move the poles. But, you know, I'd love to do more movies, and I have my stack of scripts ready. You know, one of the hopes is that maybe having a slightly higher profile will, will help me. Yeah. But now I'm fighting ageism on top Oh my god, of that's sexism. the next battle. <laughs> Um, it's huge. So, you know, everybody loves the potential of a woman in her 20s, mm -hmm. and I wish they loved the experience of a woman in her 50s as much. Right? That's our tweetable. <laughs> That's really good. Um, did you see the, the Hannah Gatsby? Nanette? I loved it. And she I said that, identify as tired. It's yes. so brilliant. When she said a 17-year-old girl is never in her prime. Never. Yeah. She said, I am in my prime. That's, yeah. That's I also, the, the line I've been thinking a lot about is um, the, I am angry and I have a right to be angry, but I don't have a right to spread anger. Yeah. And
And that's, that's so deep. And, and the point is that anger creates tension mm -hmm. and it doesn't relieve it. So we're, and, and I, I will say, you know, I do try, like in my, that big Vanity Fair piece in 2009, which was my sort of creed de corps of, of what was wrong with the late night writer's room, mm -hmm. that had solutions. That was all about focusing on this is a problem. Here's how you could solve it. And here's why the excuses are bullshit. Yeah. Um, so I do try to do that, but it was such a good reminder from her that the purpose is not to spread anger, but to um, eliminate the problem. Right, and it, it seems like the more you just speak truth as to this is the problem, hey everybody, I think that's such a giant step in getting there. Really? Because I feel like there's this, um, there's another saying I love that Melody Hobson um, uses all the time. And she says, I think we've admired the problem long enough. Oh. And that was the problem. Like I talk about in the book, um, we used to have these brunches where high level women in Hollywood would get together and we'd share our stories. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were just venting. Right. And, and you would leave angrier than when you got there because we just didn't yet, there, maybe either there wasn't enough of us or the system, Maybe social media has changed enough that we can amplify our voices now in a way that we couldn't. It seems to be step one of creating the awareness, but then I think you're right. The next step is then what do we actually do yeah. to get the change that we want? Yeah. Tell me this, what advice do you have for women who are just trying to get in? Well, if you're just trying to get in, you know, write like crazy. I mean, that's the, and, and whatever form is best for you, whether it's uh, tweeting, whether it's, it's writing funny essays, whether it's churning out scripts. Um, I think, you know, Ira Glass has that great thing about how when you start something creative, you, you have this, you have good taste and you, so you want it to be great and you read it and you, you know it's not great. But the more you do it, the closer it will get to what you want. And what's important is you have taste. Because yes. that's the discernment, right? That's the critical mind saying, no, this is, I, I, I know what I'm going for and I can't get there yet, but if I keep trying, I'll get closer. You said something else early on about, um, well, I guess Amy Holm said Oh, it? yeah, sure. Oh, I love that. So my friend Amy Holm is an actress and a writer and she's so funny. And she once said to me, uh, the only way to move forward creatively is to allow yourself to be judged. So it's not what you start, it's not even what you finish, it's what you put out for the world to see. Yeah. Uh, so you, you do have to be, let yourself be judged and be open to, um, you know, criticism always hurts, um, but it also always helps. Now along that line, how do you like to deal with networks and their notes? Don't you love too that we rebranded criticism as feedback? <laughs> Well, yeah, because criticism you can you criticism know, take issue with, sucks. but feedback, oh, you know, you can Everybody loves feedback. <laughs> oh, well, the networks, you know, you're working for them, so it's, it's a very interesting connection, and, and, you know, there are some great network executives. You know, you have someone like Nina Tassler, who was at the helm of CBS for so long, and I think a huge reason for their success. You know, she's so smart. She makes everything better. And then there are some who you're like, why are you even in this business? You don't laugh. You don't appear to like comedy. <laughs> How <laughs> you, did you get there? Yeah, well, why don't you, you know, find another lovely line of work. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how Nina gave you uh, those notes the one time where she completely dumped your B store and you didn't realize it was happening until afterwards and you were thanking her? Oh yeah, she's like the master of the dark arts where she'll, I wish she would like teach other executives because um, I had written a pilot for her and she, I, she was giving me notes and she was just raving like the, the A story, it's so smart and, 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 but the B story, you know, I just want it to be as good as the A story and it, it's just not there for me and I'm like, yes, you're right. <laughs> and it was only like five minutes after I hung up the phone that I was like, oh my God, she threw out my entire B story? Like, that's a lot of work. <laughs> but she tricked you with your A story, you're yeah. so good. <laughs> <laughs> she was right. So, no, I've actually, um, and I, 
I'd be interested to know if it's somewhat gendered, if women actually do take notes better than men. I certainly know there are stories of male showrunners like Steve Levitan locking himself in the editing room so the network couldn't get in. And I'm like, I would never do that. Right. A, because I couldn't get away with it, and B, because they're my partners. Right. So. And I wonder if part of the piece is we're always so grateful to have the job. Like we don't negotiate as much and, and I wonder if there's a piece of that in there. Sure. But I think we're also it's more that that's we're it's the professional way to act, mm -hmm. that you understand it's not ego based, it's mission based. And the mission is to make the best possible show for that particular network. And I don't think you can discount their input. Right. Let's talk a little bit about motherhood. And I I'm always so torn asking women this because we don't ask it to men, but still I ask anyway because I think everyone's still trying to figure it out. You and your husband decided that he would stay home and be the primary caretaker uh -huh. of the children. Can you talk a little bit about how you made that decision and then how it, how it worked out for you guys? It worked out great and um, <laughs> it's, you know, the other side of lean in of if you want 50% of the companies and institutions run by women, then 50% of the homes should be run by men. And uh, you know, there's no question my husband Colin was better suited. He's a more patient person. He was an architect, so he could still continue to do projects while picking the kids up from school and mm -hmm. taking them to their things. And um, he, was, he was happy to do it. And I, I know that makes me really lucky, but it's interesting because I don't think we say to men, oh, you're so lucky your, <laughs> your, one, your wife quit her job to stay home with the kids, right? No, we don't. We just kind of expect it. Yeah, and our kids are great. And in fact, one of our youngest was at college and he called us and he said, uh, someone stopped me to do some psych study today. And when I said that my father had stayed home and was the primary parent, they said, wow, you're the first person to answer that. And he said, uh, I didn't realize how odd it was. <laughs> yeah. And so for them, it was just, that was their normal. normal. That's great. Yeah. I love how uh, Pendula said to you, you're a terrible mother, but the world's greatest dad. <laughs> yeah, which one did at first offend me, and then I was like, no, that's true. <laughs> Stereotypically speaking. That's right. Um, um, right. What have we not talked about that we should have talked about? Uh, how people should buy the book. <laughs> For sure, people should buy the book. It's called Just the Funny Parts. It's so hard when you're not a celebrity to sell a book. So. I imagine it's really hard. It is hard. Well, let's sell it. Yeah. I think everyone should buy it. I read it cover to cover twice. <laughs> I think it's delicious. It's funny, right? It's hilarious. And oh, you gosh. have so many like subversive little one-liners. Like, um, like what came out of Massachusetts was three of our greatest movie stars and two of our best actors. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, as, as I <laughs> snark is my business model. <laughs> like you read it and then you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> that was some serious shade. <laughs> oh, yeah. you Just as you're talking about something serious, you throw something in there that just cracks you up. I thought it was hilarious and so meaningful and fun. Oh, I appreciate that. And such a fun inside look to the whole business. Thanks. So thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate that you um, have this podcast. Thank you. All right. You've been listening to The Other 50%, A Herstory of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Nels Govell for sharing her story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on your favorite podcast provider and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios of our guests, pictures, and the merch. You can follow us on all the social media platforms and also go subscribe to Exit 38 and the Kiss My Age show. I promise they will not disappoint. Thanks for listening. See you next time. <laughs>